So, because the kind folks at, you know, our our theaters in Trinidad and Tobago said, you know what? Oh, Lord. Megalopolis. Yeah. What What is Megalopolis? I, I don't think people will come out in droves to see Megalopolis, right? I mean... No. Well, to even, be fair, to be fair, they're right. <laughs> listen, all right, so... <laughs> <laughs> this is just a weird preamble. I'm saying weird because I'm not even going to be the one, one reviewing it. You know, in this case, we nope. have CC because they had the oh, privilege yeah. of seeing this movie in theaters. Right. While we, I saw it opening weekend. Wow. I... While, while, while us poor folk in Trinidad have to wait like a month or so, I think, until it comes I out will, digitally. And then we could say, oh, will, that's what it is. Yeah, oh, that's what it was. No, I will say this is the one time where it's not just trini movie theaters being the way they are megalopolis because of the way it is has had a really hard time finding interest like mm-hmm. coppola right. had a hard time getting anyone to finance it so he financed it himself and he right. brought the whole thing to cop to venice and all these film festivals europe loved it but what I, what I heard, what I heard mm-hmm. is that it's, it's a, it was a really old idea he's trying to make for quote unquote forty years. Yes, he's been when he's I actually work, That is work almost immediately a red flag, <laughs> in my humble opinion. He is sometimes okay, listen, okay. listen. Sometimes it is a good thing, but every almost every time I hear that, uh, my, my rule of thumb is that well, how come he didn't make it forty years ago? Uh, it probably uh, kind of bad. There was there was, yeah. was one, especially especially something with someone at his level. Because if it's like some nobody, then I right, fine. <laughs> But he is Coppola. Coppola was big 40 years ago. Well, okay. What the fuck? This, there's a couple caveats to that, though. Coppola hmm. has kind of never been the most popular filmmaker with studios. Like, like yeah, we, I get we, that. We, right, we, we know that. We, as, right. we assume, like, I feel like a lot of people, especially, like, more regular people are like, oh, yeah, you know, the guy who made the Godfather films and Apocalypse Now would have no time getting films made, though. But we forget a little film called One from the Heart. Right? Oh, the one that he made. I know, I, know I know my statement. I know my statement a little unfair. I'll admit that. But <laughs> I don't know, Jen. Like that is that's just an immediate red flag to me, though. Like because when, yeah. here's, what, here's what it also says: that when yeah. it comes out, it's gonna be outdated as hell. It was. It would have been something that would have been cutting edge forty years ago. But uh-huh. you know, I, it's forty years. Forty years past. Sorry. You know, forty years. Like, well, I, this, I think this, it. All I all I saying is again some Zack Snyder, you know, Rebel Moon energy from this. <laughs> <laughs> No, nah, that, that that's, well, a, that's a good that's a good reference there, right? But um, yeah, but yeah, yeah, you know, unfortunately, we well, didn't get the chance to see it theatrically, so you know, we have to wait yeah. until it comes out. Well, and show. like, but well, and like, yeah, also, I, also, what I thought, what I thought is that this was going to be an outright remake of Metropolis. Um, yeah, a lot so of like, people. Did. Oh yeah, yeah, right, right, and I think so. And then when I started watching the, the promo material, I was like, like I, I was watching it and thinking, wait, this is what what's going on here? Is this is this some kind of like um? You hear what I was thinking? I really feel like. It felt like, like, just just judging from the promo material, it felt like an adaptation mm-hmm. of a lost Ayn Rand novel, but like yes. Ed Wood, but it's like, but it's like Ed Wood who directed it or something. <laughs> like, like Ed I will, Wood. I will say, not Ed Wood. Oh God. Uh, <laughs> no, um, but like, it, but, that's the thing. It looked like it really looked like because when I see the hero holding up a T square, like, what's this? What, know, what, 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 did ho- what did he What did he Howard Rock? Uh, what did he uh, Howard Rock foolishness is this? Yeah. Okay, like, let me be clear before yeah. I talk. Before I talk about anything about Megalopolis, I need everyone to understand this movie is fucking weird. This right. is like huh. Megalopolis is, and I see, again, I've seen a lot of films, old and new, stuff in theater, stuff in whatever. I can say without a doubt, and this is, again, this is October, so the year is nearly over. Megalopolis is the strangest film I have seen all year, possibly for a few years. Wow. It's bananas. No, no, no. Because, like, and there's, there's so many reasons why. Like, um, again, and again, this is what I was saying about the whole uh, distribution thing. Uh, this film had the hardest time getting dist- funding in the first place. I mean, like, right. Coppola finally showed up to festivals with it. And, again, European critics actually liked it a lot better than the American ones did. But no one was really interested in distributing it. Right. Like, there's another, people were... There's another thing that somebody could, you, you probably could clear this up for me. So... It yeah, had a, a, like a, a, a callback or homage to older film culture because I heard some screens yes. had the whole, the whole live person. What is it called again? Yeah. The, the live orchestra? Uh, is it? No. No, 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 no. Matthew. Matthew. A live is person this. describing there. the movie or, or talking to the movie and no, no. referencing the movie. Yeah, what is yeah, it called yeah, again? Yeah. Benki? 
Crazy you know, in Japanese film making a lot. Like in Japanese there film. There is uh-huh. there is an I mean it, it's not in all screenings, but like certain special ones there was. There's an interactive scene in the movie. Right. I heard that. There's there's a scene and where somebody like, somebody is hired to interact with the movie. Yeah. Like it's a person in the audience. I heard that. So like, what? Yeah. Okay. That kind of interesting, no, maybe. This is what I mean by saying this movie is fucking bananas. Like right. and like and as a result of just how weird it is and how strange it is and how, like, Coppola couldn't sell this when it was a script, much less, like, and, like, barely selling it on his name. Um, and so no one was really tripping over themselves to distribute it. But then finally Lionsgate picked it up. And at first I was confused, but I've actually noticed that Lionsgate and Francis Ford Coppola have a working relationship. Like, I've noticed yeah. that they've been distributing a lot of, like, I think they're the ones who put out the, the physical media for his recut of um, The Cotton Club for example. Okay. Okay. And right. so I think that they actually have something of a working relationship. I am in awe about how badly they have handled the distribution of this film. Like before I get into the film, I am shocked how badly they are handling the distribution of this. The marketing is strange. They famously have given this a very limited release. Um, there's some regions like you guys that aren't getting it for like you, I don't think you're getting I, you guys aren't getting it in theaters at all, right? Right, like I, at I all. I don't think so. No, no, no. <laughs> no, and like yeah, yeah. There's uh, several regions, even in here in the states. There's a lot of smaller theaters and areas that are just not getting this movie whatsoever. And then there's the infamous AI controversy about the second trailer. That oh, came yes. out, which I, which I was going to bring up, right? Which I was going to close off wow. my, my preamble with, right? Because I I will never forget. I think I tag you. Yeah. I'm not tag Ricardo. I know. I, I think I tag you, CC, right? Imagine this, like on mm-hmm. the day of the morning off, right? You know, new trailer for Megalopolis, right? I'm looking at it. I'm yeah. getting Lord Fishburne saying, "Oh, you know, uh, Pauline right, Keel, right. Oh, yeah. you know, said that Godfather right. was one of the most pretentious movies of all time." Blah blah blah, right? So basically saying that you know we, yeah. we, we don't you know even with his legendary films. Um, we, you know, people did not appreciate the genius that was France. Yes. Popular, right. And, so and this like, idea okay, that, yeah. okay. But then <laughs> in the nighttime, same day, it says, oh, yeah. you know, the trailer was pulled because, oh, you know, um, they didn't oh. sign up on it and the reviews were fake and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, wow. Right. No, it, oh, it, red it, the problem is that it, it doing this, it doing this whole you know, rebellion against the system, man. You know, the critics don't know yeah. what they're talking about. Those I'm like, yeah. look, we, 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 guys, we passed that. Like, guys, we're too big for that, though. We still like, do that. Like, we really are too big yeah. for that. This is what I mean when I say that Lionsgate's handling of this movie is ass. Well, especially since the thing, and here's the thing about the quotes, and I know this from like running in film critic circles. Mm-hmm. It was film critics who sounded the alarm about something being wrong about the film, because immediately when these quotes started coming, people started fact-checking them. And lo and behold, like that quote attributed to Roger Ebert, where he supposedly describes Dracula as like style over substance. He's talking about the 89 Batman. Right. (laughs) Like, like they're just like, they're misattributing quotes. They are pulling lines and then they, and so of course Lionsgate is scrambling and of course heads are rolling. And then lo and behold, it turns out that the company that cut the trailer together used AI to generate the quotes. Right, right. So yeah, and one more, one more L for for AI. What? It, and I cannot think of a more massive L, especially with film. Because I was thinking about this, right? Regular people probably wouldn't have caught what was wrong, but like, like you know, regular yeah. Joe's on the street wouldn't have caught what was wrong because, like, you know, they're not out here reading, like, no, right. no like, like you know, right, the, the regular people on the street aren't really going to run home to their Roger Ebert collection and start paging through his reviews to the fact check it, right? That, but right, like, exactly. so, so the very people who are going to recognize names like Pauline Kale are going to fact check you. They're going to go back to their. They're going to go back to any of their records. And it's especially bad when most of the critics they claimed were didn't believe in Coppola are dead. Yeah. Like, no, the, here's the thing about this. Eh? And this is what is bothered the hell out of me. There's a very distant, I, I, we could get into a bigger, deeper discussion. I don't want to waste too much time on this. But yeah, this is outright, in my opinion, this is, is this is outright anti intellectualism. Because if you're, if you're smart enough to know who Pauline Kiel is and then to do some shit like this, it mm-hmm. shows something about you. Okay, you're not saying like yeah. some Washington Tribune, some bullshit in a corner, you know. You're, you're not Kale. saying the Washington Tribune. You're saying right. Colleen Kale. Colleen Kale, right, exactly. So you know who she is. You know that she's important. 
and you know that people think she is important, and then you will do Wait. something like that. That's insane. Yeah, that's no, it's absolutely it's insane. So it's one of the things that, like, like I one of the reasons I made a priority to see this film was because I knew that, like, the whole business of it really was starting to leave a really bad taste in people's mouth, especially after right. that second trailer dropped. Because it's a weird movie. The the pitch is very much like you're saying. It's like a lost Ayn Rand adaptation. Right. Um, and 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 then like the whole controversy with the trailer and like, ah. Uh, so I really wanted to make sure to like give this film a like to actually see the film and see it. And like, here's the thing. I've seen the film. As I said, I love it. It is one of the strangest movies I've seen all year, but I completely understand why some people are hate this film and are going to hate this film. Like, right. because I need to make this abundantly clear. Francis Ford Coppola is out of fucks to give. Right. <laughs> the old, oh. Francis the old, Ford Coppola. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's why I'm excited to see it. Oh, yeah, no. Francis Ford yeah. Coppola is at a stage in his life. Like, he said this in an interview. He's like, I'm like... My, my wife is already dead. Um, I have been making stuff in the industry for a while. There's things I regret, but like I, they're not going to change in the next five years or so. At this point, I'm just kind of making the stuff I want to make, and I know that I will die soon. And like I'm just I'm making films because I want to make films, which means that by definition, this is going. To, this is one of the most self-indulgent movies you will ever see. This is one right. of because again, this film is not interested in whether you like it or not. It is not interested in like appealing to. It's not a film that's trying to appeal to anyone really because it's a film that that it it exists to exist, and if you like it, great. <laughs> is kind of the best way I can and, describe it. And I I would say I would say that I mm-hmm. want I I want movies like this to exist. Yes, I think a lot of people do. I've been. I was saying yeah. to a friend that while this film has not really mind, been doing, yeah, right. I don't mind that. So it's no, like, no, no, well, no, no, definitely okay, not. That's but, interesting. But yes, like, but we still, we still get nonsense. So it's still, it's still kind of weird, still, right? Oh, well. Still like, like, right. And I think one of the things about it is like, and I have hope for it. Um, this is a cult film in the making. Um, oh, right, right, essentially, yeah. like. Even though the film is not doing gangbusters, it's not really finding its audience, and critics are not not a fan. Like, like not all critics. There's a bunch of critics that actually like it just well. There's a lot of right. filmmakers that like it as well. Like, right. uh, people like no, Del Toro. It, it, feels, it feels like a metaphor Woodward. for itself. That, that's how I think about it. Like, it feels like, oh, well, this it, is the thing we're talking about as as subtext for a thing. Like, like, right. how, like how um, we call it the, the menu was like a, about filmmaking, but it's about this or right. even um, yeah, yeah. we call it um chef remember chef yeah i remember chef it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, clearly about, it's clearly about his time at, at, at disney it's <laughs> like it's that right? yeah, yeah, yeah well yeah, actually that. i need to, i need to, in order to and like you guys will get this completely and i know there are members of the audience will get this completely but the best way i could describe megalopolis is actually to evoke one of coppola's favorite filmmakers um sergey eisenstein Ooh, so right. we all we all, here's the thing. Let me explain. So we all know how Eisenstein began his career making films, rev, fucking revolutionizing film language with the way he like not with editing itself, but more like the way he used juxtaposition. Right. And he's this film like, working in the Soviet Union. But as his career gets later, the Soviet Union pulls him aside and says, hey, man. We are kind of trying to make films. Like, like we're not like we're not trying to outright make propaganda. We kind of are cough, cough, but also we're not trying to outright make propaganda. But we are interested in films for the masses. We are increasingly concerned that your films are growing increasingly self-indulgent and just strange. Like one of the things about Eisenstein is that there's a lot of juxtaposition. The, the way he uses juxtaposition is stuff we still see in films. Like I think like if you remember the bit in Lord of the Rings when um Faramir is riding out against the orcs and it's intercut with like Denethor sitting at the, his banquet table eating grapes. He's got the red juice dripping out. Congratulations. Peter Jackson has seen Sergei Eisenstein films. Like, right. like, like, right. but here's the thing about Eisenstein. As his films went on, his juxtapositions got weirder, right? right. So like right. a great example. So like, so, okay. So you watch a movie like strike, and there's a group of striking workers being put down by the police, intercut right. with their bosses eating a great big feast, intercut with a bull being slaughtered. OK, right. it's a right. little complex, but at the same time, you still get what he's saying. By the time we get to 10 days that shook the world, he's evo- he's doing things like, I don't know, 
there's a shot of people rioting in the street intercut with like but like you know the good revolutionaries intercut with african tribal masts and a right. peacock made out of iron or something like you're starting to go okay eisenstein you're evoking something but i'm not sure what you're evoking kind of it compels me but at the same time you're like like essentially like as his films go on he's getting increasingly opaque he's getting increasingly like obtuse he's kind of doing the thing that paul schrader talks about in slow cinema of like his films are increasingly leaning away from you and i think that coppola especially with megalopolis is firmly at that point so like i'm just gonna talk about like i'm gonna talk about the plot super quick because i actually this film is not a narrative object first and foremost like it's essentially it's a political drama um in a sort of version of new york that's also ancient rome um it's uh, because, you know, Coppola, Coppola is directly drawing parallels between contemporary America and ancient Rome, talking about right, how, right. you know, Rome, like Rome was a society that like essentially making the argument that Rome was a society in the opening of the film, making the argument that civilizations collapse because their people don't believe in them. So to keep civilizations going, we must have dreamers, essentially. And by right. the way, this is the kind of esoteric ideas and dialogue that the film is full of no one in this film has a like normal conversation about anything every conversation right, right, is right, kind right. of philosophical it's theatrical right. it's over the top it's like <laughs> look i i i don't hate it's on very, this, no, it's this, cool. this this all this how i feel about this how i feel about like say uh yogos lantamos like yes a lot, yeah. of, a lot a lot of his movies i just don't get i will admit that like like, yeah, he's like he's like a, he button fifty for me. Like right now, he like button mm-hmm. five hundred for me. He just do like it. Just one movie I'll totally understand, and I find it's like the funniest, most clever thing ever. And then the other movie, I don't get. You'll be like, and then our next movie, the I thought this was like, the funniest, most clever thing ever. I watched in a long time. Then the next movie, don't fucking get it. And he just one I'll get, the other one I don't get. One I get, right. one I don't get. So and yeah, I, yeah, you yeah. Know, and I've yet to have people explain to me in a way that I could get it, like instead of some <laughs> vague, abstract, like postmodern bullshit. And I'm using postmodern in the derogatory sense of the term, right? Um, <laughs> postmodern it, it, derogatory. The, 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 like, the, 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 the version of postmodernism that we we we, we satirize, right? That bullshit. That bullshit. Yeah. It really feel like that. It's feel like that, right? Um, well, but like, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah. and like Megalopolis is an idea movie. Like you were talking about right. how this film right. hasn't been made. Like the entire premise, I, again, he's also loosely adapting a real historical event that happened where essentially a cataclysm occurred in Rome and there was a big fight politically about whether right. they should rebuild the city even better or just kind of keep it the way it was. And Coppola encountered that story and decided this was the most fascinating philosophical idea he'd ever encountered. And right. so we end up, and so he translates that to kind of modern day America, specifically New York. And again, he started messing around with it in the 70s. But as we know, after one from the heart bombed, he then spent the rest of the 80s into the 90s getting gigs from studios to pay off, essentially pay off all the debt he was in, um, which is bizarre to me because during that era, he was also putting out some really wild shit. Like, I really love the two S.E. Hutton adaptations he did, um, um, The Outsiders and Rumblefish. Um, yeah. I have a soft spot for one from the heart. I need to revisit the Cotton Club, especially the Encore cut, because that movie is just dense in a way that does my head in, but it compels me. Um, but he was all this time he's messing around with Megalopolis and he's trying different ideas and messing things around with it. But then he does get a script going and he starts developing it. And he's looking to cast uh, Nicholas Cage in the main part as uh, essentially, again, a cataclysm befalls the city of New Rome. Uh, which is again this kind of New York. That's kind of hilarious that Nicholas Cage could have been a, could have been a this. Yeah, that, he was I, gonna, like, uh, I think I think people don't receive it a little better if it was. <laughs> but uh, you want to look at it and say, all right, this is not serious. You know, I, listen, I love Nicholas Cage as an actor. He's a great actor. But oh, yeah. lay it with it. He basically became a meme, right? He's a meme now. Yeah, yeah, long, became, in fact, him being a meme is the whole idea. Even he acknowledged that with making, you know, the unbearable weight of massive talent. Like he said, that was why he was hesitating about it. But then, like, he kind of leaned into it. But, like, so, and what happens is there are two political factions. Like, there's there's all these political factions vying for power. And in the middle of it is a politically significant architect character who wants to take this opportunity. He has discovered a bizarre. First of all, the trailers kind of tease at this. Let me just explain it. He has the superpower to stop time. Right. It is never explained. It's not relevant. It's not, no. it's not relevant. It's like it, it's <laughs> wow. just like a move, move on. Like he, he can stop. Time, he can freeze time. 
and observe so it's, it's like one of those but so it's one of those like just not really it's, it's, here's the thing okay so i don't want to spoil the film but can he actually yeah. freeze time or it's just one of those like he just no, he can, he can, the world he can freeze time he can he can freeze time. He can share the ability. Oh, for real? Like, I, oh, I wow. think he, yeah, I think he can actually freeze time. I, get, <laughs> I, really I say think because I've seen the movie and I'm still puzzling certain parts of it out. But there is a whole... Yeah, I think... Well, and like he's also invented a new substance that is... Right wonderful and amazing and stuff and, it, and he wants to... <laughs> that, that was saying, that's something like Ayn Rand. That's something like Ayn Rand story. That's not, um... no, no. Coppola made a list of films that inspired this movie, and one of them is the 1930s version of The Fountainhead. 1930s? Okay, why don't you write that way? There's a... Yeah, there's a... Like a let me double check, but there's like a... Why yeah. you you wrote Fountainhead? I'm not sure. Like, there's a... There's a... There's a... There's an... Adap- yeah, no, like, there's a really old adaptation of The Fountainhead okay. that he... That he flags as one of the big inspirations... For like for the movie and it's right, right, right. So straight uh, up, okay. it's well, yeah, 1940s. Yeah, sure, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, and That's like it. there's a there's a 1949 adaptation with Gary Cooper, and that and like right. Coppola's like, yeah, this is one of the inspirations for Megalopolis. Right. So yeah, all the Iron Man you're picking up on, yep, it's there. It it it's absolutely there. Um, it is it is part of it. Make of that what you will. This movie has right. so much going on that if you that it's one of those movies that i feel like it's kind of a bit of a rorschach test what you take away from it is going to be very different going from person to person because there's just so much going on um but he wants to rebuild the city and he wants to like rebuild it with this new mysterious substance that he has that i'm not sure what it does but it's really good and it helps to build like better like like this like is this something like programmable matter? That is, uh, is this something like some yeah, think, from Star Trek. Yeah, a little, a little bit like that. Yeah, that's a good way of, yeah. of putting it because you can do kind of anything you want with it. So the possibilities for it architecturally are limitless. Right. Um, but the problem is he's caught up in all this stuff because you got two rival families that are vying for control of the city, and there's a mayor played by Giancarlo Esposito who is who who is not beloved by the people because his regime is struggling, and then like the, his rival oh, played oh. by John Voight is part of the family that Adam Driver's character is from. So, but Megalopolis almost got made in the 2000s. Uh, Megalopolis right. almost got made in the 2000s. But as you can tell from the plot, um, you know, New Rome gets to New York, Rome, which is set in New York, gets destroyed. And right, so there's yeah. an argument about rebuilding John, John Carroll, it. So, um, John Carroll is Eric Adams, basically. So around, and so around the time that... And so, but the thing is, a little event happened to At New York 11. in 2001 yep. right. that immediately scrapped Megalopolis. Like, the film wow. went back to the shelf right for, right. Right. yeah, okay. no, 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 so no. no. Of, okay, well that, okay, that make this a little more interesting, though. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. Like, like right. all discussion of making it, that, that was the version I was going to have Nicholas right. Cage, and it was getting pretty close to production, and then 9-11 happened, and all discussion, like, all the doors that Coppola had been, all the people he'd been talking to kind of were, were shut in his, in his face, essentially. Right. Like it was right. like, oh, okay, this is, this is not happening. And it took him a while. And he said, he's never really given up on it and just keeps messing with it and tinkering with it. Right. And finally got it together. And finally was like, put on like his own money at this point, which again, if you're going to make a movie, as self-indulgent as Megalopolis, and you're putting your own money down for it, you know, this is why I think this film is going to develop a cult following, because there is quite literally nothing like it playing in theaters. And audiences want, if there's one thing we've seen from the films that have actually been hits, audiences want something a little different. Like, they want something a little weird, even if it doesn't quite make sense a little bit. Like, and again, Megalopolis doesn't always, because, like, that's the plot. Um, there's all there's a whole romance stuff between the daughter of Giancarlo Esposito's mayor and the architect character. Um... There's a bad guy who is like kind of a younger cousin. He's the cousin of the architect. He's played by Shia LaBeouf. But with in some pretty intentional cast, like this is in in a kind of a genius bit of stunt casting. Coppola cast um, Shia LaBeouf as a pretty odious character in a pretty fascinating way. And he kind of admitted as much in an interview. He's like, yeah, I kind of. They were a couple act because someone asked him, like, uh, you cast a couple people in this that have kind of been canceled. And he was like, yeah, I, I right, wanted right, right. audience to kind of bring a certain me- that certain meta knowledge with them. Right. Um, who else is in this? Um, uh, John Voight. 
John um, Voight, right? I was saying, I was going, oh, he's, he's like, the oh, other, he's the other. Like, he, he, oh, was the last time he was in a big movie? Because, you know, you know, like some big, big time. Oh, yeah, because, oh, no, right. he's, he's a, he's a vocal Trump supporter. That's why no right, one exactly. Oh, yeah, calls yeah, it I, anymore. That, that like, I didn't know. I didn't know. Yes. Yeah. Trump. No, no, no. He literally said that Trump was the greatest president America's ever had since Abraham Lincoln. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Like, and then no one in Hollywood picked up his calls anymore. Right, right, right. Um, I mean, he was always on him even before that, from Anderson. Oh yeah, he was. He was. I think for a while he he'd had a couple like um, different things going on. Um, what else was I? Uh, who else is in this movie? Aubrey Plaza is in oh. this movie as like a talk show host lady who's kind of having a thing with. Um, uh, the architect character Caesar, right. but then she. I, so, I, 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 right now, I enjoy, I enjoy her in uh, what do you call it um, in Agatha. A- Agatha all along, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Like, oh, okay. I, 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 I think she's pretty good in that. So it's like, okay, okay. she in this, all right? Yeah. And then, oh yeah. Um, I, and, that girl from oh, that girl from Game of Thrones in this, and like, all right. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a good cast too. So like, right, cool. I, I like Adam Driver. And I really like Adam. Oh yeah. He gets to. I I kid you not. Adam Driver gets to do the to be or not to be monologue in this movie. Right, right, right. right. Oh, really? And it is never quite explained why. <laughs> he just kind of burst into the to be or not to be monologue during a press conference. And even the characters are looking at him like, what is he doing? And other people are like, let's see where he's going with this. And he just says, the, I thought he was just going to do like the first line. No, it's the full, it's the full to be or not to be that like monologue. And it's, it's, it's kind of fantastic. Um, who else is in this movie? Uh, Dustin Hoffman in a role that was originally going to be for James Caan. It's kind of a smaller role, but... And then Lawrence Fishburne is both um, Adam Driver's chauffeur and confidant, but then also the narrator. It's... I, I don't know how Because, of course, he has to be the narrator. I mean, look at the trailer, right? I mean, oh, yeah! Right? The... With that voice, he like, absolutely has to be the narrator. Um, and... When I explain, like, the, the the big thing about this movie that I need, because I feel like people hear, like, people have been hearing about the plot. And I'm like, don't, don't worry about the plot. Don't worry. Do not worry about the plot of Megalopolis. The thing that is going to decide whether you like this film, it's not going to be the plot. It's not going to be the dialogue, because those are both. Like, the, the plot is kind of the vessel for the film itself, and the dialogue is just part of the style. But that's the thing. Whether you click with this film or not, is entirely, entirely going to depend on how you react to its style. Because Megalopolis's style is the first thing you notice. It is the most prominent thing. Like, everything from the way the film is shot, the way it is edited and cut together, the way the colors work, the, the saturation, the voiceover narration. Um, the And then this is where I evoked Eisenstein, there's a lot of inter- really fascinating intercutting. Like, there's a lot of really fascinating juxtaposing images against other images. There's a sequence where um, New Rome is is falling, and there's a lot of political drama going on. Intercut with an Elvis impersonator in an alley singing America the Beautiful against an American flag. Right? And then there's a lot of shots of flowers that just kind of appear in the middle of the screen and they're there um the style oh, this is a film i promise you i have no idea if you are going to like this film or if you're going to hate this film but i promise you you have seen nothing like it but also if you hate it i completely understand like that's the thing i love this film to bits and i could i could watch it i could watch it again um, it's one of those movies I keep wanting everyone I know to see it because I want to talk about it. Coppola made this film for, to be talked about. Coppola made this film so people could discuss it. He literally says as much. Like, he says, I want civilization to have more conversations. And so he, like, he wants to have conversations about evolution, the development of humanity, the state of civilization, um, culture, ideas the role that artists play in a society, optimism versus pessimism. There's a lot of ideas and Coppola clearly wants people thinking about them and talking about them. And I, and the film is like, this is why I really wish there was more intelligent reviews of the film. Like I mostly see people on like Letterboxd or shit going like this film sucked mega cockles. And I'm like, if you don't like the film, please come up with an intelligent reason to dislike the film. Because like I, because like, 
like if you if you don't like this film, that's great. But I want you to talk about why, because then we're getting a conversation going. And this is a film that kind of demands conversation because it is just so dense and it is so difficult and it is so like there are people that are going to this is my one critique about the film is that this is a film that for worse kind of looks better because again this film uses a lot of digital effects this film uses a lot of like it's not quite as intense as something like um captain sky in the world of tomorrow but there are sequences that feel similar where it feels like these characters are in an almost completely virtual environment or environment that has been augmented by the like lighting and coloring and digitization that it feels like they're in an almost completely virtual environment and here's the thing it looks great on the big screen, but I know this is a movie that's going to look like ass on home media and especially on like laptops and iPads. And that's that's a shame. Like that, that's my one that is genuinely my one critique. Literally everything else about the movie. Um, I don't have a lot in the way of like main critiques because I'm like, there's not really any metric I can measure this film against about like, you know, like I could say that this film isn't really going to attract audiences, but like, that's not its goal. I could say that this film was a frustrating narrative object, but it's not a narrative object. I could talk about its ideas, but the film deliberately has so many ideas that it's hard to pick ideas out and like say, this is the film's main idea. And especially when it's a film that like has so many sequences of characters, you know, talking to you about ideas. And it be, like so there's not really any metric where I can say this film is bad, but I will say that this is a film that if you can see it on a big screen, do it because it will the quality of it will look will worth and that, that's a, and that's a criticism actually that's a genuine criticism because I think that if you're making films at this point, making a film that will only like I, I always hate the argument of this film was meant for the big screen. I'm like, okay, but you know that we live in a global world and not everyone is going to be able to see this on the big screen. And if you're making a film just to be on the big screen, you're kind of ignoring all the people that aren't able to see it on the big screen. And that is, that's a shame. So that's my one critique of the film. Otherwise I thought this was one of the most bananas things I've ever seen. Um, this is Coppola really leaning into, this is Coppola leaning into all the things he learned about expressive film style in his 80s period. So like if you're going do not expect I I beg of you do not expect The Godfather. Do not expect Godfather Part 2. Do not and but like think about the dreamier sequences in Apocalypse Now. Think about the style the more stylized elements of Rumblefish or the Outsiders. Think about how absolutely bananas the style in his Dracula movie are. That's kind of the wavelength you need to be thinking about in regards to Megalopolis, because that's kind of more that this film's speed. Um, yeah, as I said, rating, um, go see it. I really can't. I can't. I can't rate this film. There's not really a good, like, metric by which I can say aha, this is a good film, aha, this is, a, even my usual, my usual thing with criticism, um, I use the three, I use the, th I, I have three questions to ask myself, what is this work of art trying to achieve, is the attempt worthwhile, does it succeed? I am so struggling with the, what is it trying to achieve, aside from have ideas, that like, it is, becomes even more difficult to, an to answer the other two questions, so my rating for Megalopolis is, go see it, and please, Come tell me all about your thoughts about it because I am fascinated. <laughs> all right, so so I have just a few things to say, right? Just a few quick things, right? One, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, when when this <laughs> drops digitally, um, similar to kinds of kindness, which Ricardo and I talked about a while back from Yogo yeah. Lantimos, <laughs> I'm just gonna take a Sunday morning, just have a cup of coffee, yes. dinner, just sit down and just embrace you know that embrace but just soak in just, the film and then you know in. hopefully ricardo and i will talk about it afterwards right that's one um yeah secondly um i i know for sure this is gonna show up in either a best or worst stuff you know when it comes to yes to, to, you know whether it's in the wire or i don't know roger ebert i know it's gonna show up on, on a lot of best and worst right this is going to this is the most this is one of the most divisive films of the year this is going to be on a lot of best and worst lists right no in between and lastly, um, just with the sheer ambition that I'm hearing about this film, I wouldn't be surprised if one day it pops up in a Criterion collection. 
Like if it oh, shows up there, like this, similar to like how um, uh, Heaven's Gate is there, you know what I mean? Like a mm-hmm. show that was so misunderstood right. back then and still to this day. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. I've yeah. not seen Heaven's Gate, but I want to see that director's cut. I'll be like, Heaven- okay, okay, okay. Oh, yeah. right. oh, I, will, yes, I will say it does have a lot. I was actually talking to another, um, a friend, uh, shout out to uh, Bobby Carmi, who's a film critic in his own right. Um, we were talking about how this film does have a lot in common with that period. Like, the films that killed New Hollywood, you know, that period where like the New Hollywood ambition peaked so hard that they ended up making a bunch of films that were like really like Heaven's Gate is a masterpiece. One of my favorite movies of all time, but it is a punishingly long film. Like it's and I'm not and like, here's the, as I said, one of my all time favorites in my top 250. But I completely understand that for some people, a four hour movie that is as slow and as meticulous, but also as brutal and unkind to its audience as it is sometimes, is a very difficult movie to actually sit with and process. Um, similar to um, talking about Scorsese, um, his film New York, New York, where he yeah. does this bizarre thing where he combines the artificial style of the MGM musicals of the 40s and 50s and which, haha, foreshadowing is a literary device, uh, where he, he combines the style of musicals of the 40s and 50s, but combines them with all of the, of the like acting techniques of the 70s and creates a very incongruous film with jagged edges that I absolutely adore because of how difficult it is. And then, of course, Coppola's own One from the Heart, a movie that is one of the most deliberately artificial films I have ever seen. Like one from the heart does not take place in a real world at all. And it does not pretend to in any shape, size or form. It takes place in the most heightened stylized artificial studio environment. And it's phenomenal. And these are all films that at the time, like again, these and a bunch of other movies that came out around the same time, um, killed the new Hollywood movement. Cause this was a time when like the big studios were taking charge of film companies and they were really prioritizing movies like Star Wars and Jaws. Right. And, and like they wanted movies that made money back. And so what ended up happening was you had way too many films. And like, yeah, these we're also talking about studio killers. Because again, One from the Heart killed Francis Ford Coppola's own production company. Heaven's Gate took United Artists down with it when it went up in flames. Like... Right. Like, and I think that Megalopolis is on par. If me, like, this is why none. This is why none of these studios wanted to distribute this film because it has that kind of. I am. It has that complete disinterest in being popular. Like, let me be clear: the movie wants to find an audience. Um, the movie wants to engage with an audience, but the movie is not interested in being popular. It is not interested right. in reaching as many people as possible. It's just looking for the little freaks that are on its wavelength, essentially. Right. And studios match, don't match, like match movies like freak. that. Yes, Match My Freak, like Match My Nasty. Like, Megalopolis wants you to, which is also wild because Megalopolis also has, oh lord, um, there's, a, there's a very, up, like, I don't know how to put this, but there's a, there's a sex scene in Megalopolis that's one of the most, I don't know how to put this, you just have to see the movie. But yeah, this is a very freaky, freaky movie. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it, this is a very freaky movie. And this movie is looking for people to match its freak. It's not looking to be popular, which is why. Uh, I, I have my question. So uh, my one yes. question. Yes, yes, please. Okay, so you, you were not at the interactive screening. The interactive I was not. Part. No, I, I wish I was. No. Right. But what, I, so, what was it, there, so I think there was a voiceover for it instead. For the, uh, for the no, no. So. The way that that scene plays I miss, is... Sorry, um, I missed... I, miss, I, miss, I, I left for two seconds. So I think I missed that part here. Oh, sorry. you're fine. Um, uh, yeah, you, some of the stuff I was talking about. But no, for the, the interactive scene is literally um, Adam Driver's character is giving a press conference and he takes up... Um, and he's, like, on screen. And then what's supposed to happen is a member of the audience stands up and asks him the question. Like, right. you know, the paid actor who's placed there ahead of time. And then he turns and answers it in question. But yeah, you're right. But yeah... In versions where they don't have the interactive screening, um, what happens instead is like, there's, like the question is played as like a voice of like someone in the crowd. Because again, the way that the shot is framed is Adam Driver's character is kind of facing the audience. So yeah, there's like a voiceover from like a character that is presumably in the audience 
or like off screen who asks the question instead and then he answers it. But yeah, in the interactive screenings, what would happen was a member of the audience at Ka, I, at, I think it was Venice. Um, it was Jason Schwartzman, who's in the film as well, by the way, just in case. Just, 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 yeah. Okay, that, that, I didn't know. I didn't know. Jason Schwartzman actually stood up and addressed the screen and asked a question. And, you know, the like Adam Driver in the film answered him and the crowd went wild. Like, like it's a gimmick. I, I, it's, it's a gimmick. Um, if the whole movie is not like that, I might have actually been a little harsher on that. But it's like one scene. Um, and like, I have a soft spot for that. Like, like those kind of gimmicks that not like, like, um, like William Castle's films, for example. Um, like I really, for example, love the scene in the, for those of you who don't know, um, there's this great William Castle horror film, The Tingler, which is about a parasite that lives in people's spines that causes fear or something. And what would happen during the screenings is they'd be, they would be like the people in the movie would be dealing with the tingler. And then the tingler would get loose and then the screen would go off. And then Vincent Price, who's the main character in the film, would run on screen, turn to the audience and say, ladies and gentlemen, the tingler is loose in this very theater. And then buzzers in people's chairs would go off. So it would like make their spines <laughs> vibrate and people panicked and freaked out. We're that running around awesome. like, yeah, I mean, no, I, have, it, it, I listen, people, people just knock the whole, the, the whole 40X thing. But if you do it right, you do it right. Oh, you do it right, yeah. This is why, um, shout out to uh, Joe Dante made a really genuine love letter to William Castle and filmmaking in general with, um, oh God, it's uh, mat Matinee. Yes, Matinee. If one of the best movies about filmmaking I've ever seen, um, if you have not seen it, highly recommend another one of my all-time favorites. Okay. Um, and it's, and it's, it's <laughs> of, of the favorites I have listed in this episode, it's a lot more digestible than uh, <laughs> Heaven's Gate. Uh, but yeah. Right. <laughs> But no, I have I have a soft spot for those kind of um, filmmaking gimmicks. If you do it like, yeah, 40X is absolutely stupid. But if you do it right, you know, yeah. like you can create a genuinely Im impactful experience. Um, and Coppola has always argued that there is inherent links between theater and film. This is the man who actually said that he wanted to do one from the heart as a live film. And everyone's like, what right. do you mean? He's like, I wanted to shoot the film live. And I wanted to shoot what? and edit the film live being broadcast into theaters. Okay. Well, that's what I heard about this. I heard that this would work more like a, a theater kind of thing. I think there's definitely right. ways in which this would be. I mean, I, there's also so many aspects to the style that are uniquely cinematic. Like I was explaining earlier, um, the, one of the big evocations of Eisenstein is all the juxtapositions and intercutting and fade overs and iris zoom ins and iris edits and like transitions and um, character and flashbacks and like use of color and things. Like there's a lot of things that are uniquely cinematic. As far as like the the plot itself, like it does have a lot of theatrical um, elements to it. There's a lot of theatricality, right. and it would play, it, I think it's actually played decently well as a stage play, um, in my opinion. But yeah, um, I feel like it is important to remember that Coppola has always been obsessed with kind of pushing the idea of what a film can even be. This is the man. I know we all lose our minds about that one transition in The Godfather where um, his his mustache turns into a tree. Right. And it's a oh, great, yeah. it's a great <laughs> cut. Mm. What does it mean, though? <laughs> that's that's, oh, yeah. that's a good point. <laughs> like it's a great cut. What does it mean? <laughs> <You're right>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so Ricardo boy, um, you know we 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 definitely have we were cut out for us when we see this movie at home digitally. Yes. Again, like I said, you know Sunday morning coffee, sit down, watch this <laughs> thing, try to digest it, and then yeah, talk about how good or bad it was or both. You know what I mean? So, All right. Yay, cut like, it. <laughs> if you if you if you hate this, I I completely understand. I I all right, I'll, I'll close this. I I want to like it, and I feel like in retrospect, okay. you know, um, filmmakers are gonna look at this moment in time yes. and gonna either be worried for themselves or they're right. just gonna be like, all right, this is well, what here, I want, here. this is the level I want to reach at when I when I reach Coppola's age. Or okay, this is I don't want to do <laughs> no, this. Here. I just want to retire and just live my life and not make you know not make films I, that people are gonna call pretentious right in so but, 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 mm -hmm. but to be fair but hearing about hearing that it was supposed that 9 11 undermined makes a lot more interesting yeah because i didn't know that at all and that's mm -hmm. actually like okay that recontextualizes what the film could have been it does because again yeah. in that in that parallel world yeah we'd get like an amazing film in 2000 and whatever three or whatever come out you know that thing i feel like, like whatever 
I feel like this movie, this movie coming out in 2000, I mean, it, it probably wouldn't have come out in this form in 2000, but if it had come out in 2000, I feel like it would have felt like making contact with aliens. Oh, no, it was, it was in pre-production and it, was, it, it didn't it even get to pre-production in 2001. I think it, did, I think it did get to pre-production. It was in pre-production okay. and they had a couple cast members lined up back in the okay, day. Okay. And then the, That's what I'm saying. Like, you know, in my head, in my head is like, oh, well, this is when Spider-Man two would have come out or something like that yes 2004 yes. Whatever. like like yeah, yeah it was it was um it was, it was very much like a spider-man situation where certain elements got kind of retooled right, or right. a little bit like how you know they got a little nervous about the title for the second lord of the rings movie or things like that like yeah the atmosphere in hollywood changed overnight more or less overnight yeah. It's kind yes. of one of the things that makes the uh, Spike Lee's 9/11 movie so absolutely breathtaking because you're like he yeah. just ad- addressed it head on like oh, goddamn right, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. He, did, I yes. about him. Mm-hmm. he get away yeah. yeah 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 so Megalopolis I mean thank you so much for the review CC and of course yeah, yeah, thank uh, you most likely God willing you know Ricardo and I will check it out and you know we'll tag you and let you know what we thought about it I'm very excited right. to hear your thoughts. <laughs> 